Good. So um, I like to promote uh, people who are here in time. So let's start. It's two o'clock. Um, warm welcome. Uh, today we're uh, going to focus in on this year's grant call and it's going to be a Q&A session. So um, the way that I want to run this meeting uh, is really by making you ask questions, either you uh, tap them into the chat or you um, uh, speak up. But the idea is that we uh, keep this session within an hour, could be quicker. Uh, I will moderate. I will start with uh, the research uh, grant and uh, we'll hear from um, Agustina and Elisa Marie who are right now working on a project. Uh, and after they have given you an idea of what they do, I will explain the process for the research grant and I'll let you know uh, criteria that we look for and you ask your questions. So that's the first uh, part of the session. The second part, we zoom in on the educational grant call. Uh, I have invited Eric. Eric is working on a, uh, an interesting project in Rwanda and he will give us uh, uh, an idea of what he's doing. And then we go through the criteria for the educational grant and you ask your questions. And that will be the second half of, of the session. I hope this sounds uh, like a good idea. Uh, just very briefly on, uh, on PAR, uh, we aim to uh, eradicate the spread of antibiotic uh, resistance. And uh, the way we want to do that is to be able to, to use our uh, muscles in the most impactful way. And we think that is supporting teams that uh, do research and, and educate health pro professionals. Um, to prevent antibiotic resistance. And that means that we want to work with people like you. We want to find uh, key opinion leaders and uh, uh, researchers who can help educate colleagues uh, to support the general health sector or engage the next generation of uh, researchers. And ultimately, the work that we do uh, with you will then help influence politicians to put more resources into this and acknowledge and, and put light on this really important topic. Like I said, uh, today is all about the grant call 2023, application deadline, April 12th. Uh, and we are funding research, education and information uh, initiatives that contributes to prevent antibiotic resistance. And this year we've decided to put up two uh, different grants. We have the research grant um, and the educational grant. The research grant is um, looking for projects that will increase knowledge for uh, preventive uh, activities in bacterial infections and antibiotic resistance but with new methods. Um, and the educational grant is zooming in on the next generation of researchers, uh, like I said, who, uh, who wants to drive educational initiatives that increase the understanding uh, and spread knowledge about antibiotic resistance and how we can fight the spread of AMR. Uh, we will start then uh, today's session with the uh, research grant, but the application process is similar to both these uh, tracks. Um, you have to put your application in by answering questions in the digital form. The link is in the bottom of this page if you haven't seen it already. Uh, so opencall.parfoundation.org. Um, the ones that we see have potential will give a chance to submit follow-up questions if needed, if it's not completed. And uh, we will conduct interviews during early May. Then by the end of May, we will select a number of finalists that are presented uh, to um, uh, the board uh, of uh, PAR Foundation and decisions will be made end of May. Uh, we contact 
the grantees and the candidates who are selected early uh, June. And then the external communication of winners will be done in mid June, just to give you a timeline of, of the process. Uh, one thing that is important to note is that we promote uh, transparency and accessibility. So we want the reporting of your methodology and, and the way that you set up the projects to be uh, transparent. We want to be able to talk about it uh, if needed. And um, we want to give access uh, as well to uh, fellow colleagues um, like we do here today. Um, we might ask for um, pre-registration of research questions if we do seminars in the future and, and people want to engage. So I just want you to know that when you apply, we, we want to be able to have a, a very open and transparent um, uh, process and work during the time that the grant is um, uh, active. Okay, should we then start by uh, handing over to Agustina and Eliza? Um, Agustina and Eliza, you work uh, in, at the University of Ghana in, in Ghana, uh, and uh, you have a project that you started already uh, a year and a half ago now, or is it even more now? I hand over to you, uh, Eliza, to tell us a bit about uh, the process, and you can then uh, take over. I'll stop share my screen and you take over um, the screen. And your sound, you need to turn it off on as well. Yes, I hope hey. you can see my full screen now. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon. I'm Elise Marie Kwesi Maripaat, and today I present my project, Genomics Host Pathogen Interactions, Unaligned Stratopox Pneumonia Effects in the Gan Elderly Population. I present also on behalf of Dr. Oxina Frimpong, who is principal investigator on this project. And we do our research at the Kuchimura Institute of Medical Research, the University of Ghana. So we work in Ghana. Um, so we focus at the elderly. And why do we do that? So the elderly population in sub-Saharan Africa is increasing. The life expectancy is increasing, that is good. But the elderly come with their own specific health issues. And one of the issues is that they are more vulnerable to infection. Uh, and one of the common infections in the elderly is pneumonia, so infection of the lung. And uh, this is because the immune cells in the elderly they have decreased functionality. This is a normal biological process called neurosenescence. Uh, but it makes them more vulnerable for infections. So bacterial infections, including bacterial pneumonia, are often treated with antibiotics. Um, this can also contribute to the development of antimicrobial resistance. But before we can study that, we need to know um, how elderly health in Sub-Saharan Africa is in general. And we know very little about it because it's a group that's not often been studied. So we need to know what are the most common types of infections, what are the most common bacteria uh, often found in these infections, and what's the antimicrobial resistance uh, status. Also, what the state of the immune cells, so can they fight the infections? What's the general health status, and what's the nutritional status? And both the nutritional status, general health status, immune cell status, they all contribute and work together uh, to fight infections. So in this research project, uh, we have basically three goals. The first one is to determine material carriage in healthy elderly and elderly hospitalized pneumonia. Then we also want to know from these bacteria that we found in the elderly, uh, post antimicrobial sensitivity, and uh, can we detect mutations in the bacterial DNA that cause antimicrobial resistance? And then we also want to investigate how the elderly immune system is affected by bacterial infection and how antimicrobial resistance shapes this immune response. So what do we do? So we work with elderly, so that are those uh, age 60 and above. So we uh, recruit have basically two groups. One is elderly patients with pneumonia from the hospitals, uh, to the military hospital, Cordobo Teaching Hospital. And the other group is the elderly uh, without pneumonia from local communities. We see some pictures of our outreach from yesterday, um, 
I went to a local community to uh, take samples and data from participants. So what we do is we ask them for the demographics, so age, gender, education level, etc. We ask them about use of antibiotics, we check their vitals, we examine the nutritional status, we take nasopharyngeal swaps, so swaps uh, deep in the nose to look at bacteria there. We take blood samples to look at immune cells in the blood and to look at um, bacterial infection in the blood. And we take urine samples to look at urinary tract infections. So, so far, we in total have included over 150 uh, participants, 54 from the hospitals and 104 communities. Uh, most of them 60 to like 101 years old. Uh, we see that there are a bit more females uh, than males, which is also something that is uh, what you expect in the population uh, because they are uh, elderly. Unfortunately, not every participant was able to provide samples. So we still got a decent number of samples, both nasopharyngeal swaps, blood samples, and also urine samples. So when we now look at those samples, uh, so the nasopharyngeal swaps first, um, we see in the health participants um, a whole range of different bacteria. Um, so we see, for example, a very big population of Staphylococcus epidermidis, which is a bacteria, a commensal um, of a found human skin. So it doesn't really have to cause any infection, it is just there. But for example, we also found like uh, Plepsida pneumonia, which can cause pneumonia, or like Staphylococcus aureus, which can cause multiple uh, serious infections. Uh, and also pneumonia patients, uh, we see the staph epimidus, but we also see staph hemolyticus, which is involved in infections like sepsis, for example, and a whole range of pseudomonas. Um, so yeah, we found a lot of very interesting uh, bacteria. And also when we look at the urine samples from the communities, uh, we find many different bacteria. Um, uh, and I highlighted a few uh, that are of public health uh, relevance, especially in urinary tract infections. And what we want to know from uh, all these bacteria, especially those of public health relevance, is what is the antimicrobial sensitivity status? So we started with the Staphylococcus aureus because um, these are well known bacteria that often develop uh, antimicrobial resistance. So we had eight isolates and we tested the sensitivity for a whole range of antibiotics. And so what we then observed is that seven out of the eight isolates uh, were resistant against penicillin. And uh, three were also resistant against cefoxitin, which uh, means that they the MRSA uh, bacteria. I think you might have heard about it. It's uh, a bacteria that the hospitals uh, fear. Uh, and there's also one strain that besides penicillin was also resistant to, to more um, antibiotics, which makes it not drug resistant. So from these eight isolates, there are basically four that um, have serious antimicrobial resistance uh, status and makes it difficult to treat. Um, so then we next wondered, okay, uh, antimicrobial resistance is often driven by improper use of antibiotics. So what we do is we also ask the elderly uh, how often they take antibiotics. And this is from the pneumonia patient at the hospital. And what is actually quite shocking is that almost half of them report to us that um, they say that they take antibiotics every month. Uh, we should be a bit careful that they not always completely understand the meaning of antibiotics, but this serious um, is really serious. And it's also good to notice that uh, even though antibiotics should only be a prescription, uh, in Ghana, it is quite easy to just get them over the counter at the pharmacy. Uh, and then from the local communities, um, there are more participants who say they never use antibiotics, but still a substantial part of them use antibiotic uh, regularly. So I think there's still room for education, general public about proper use antibiotics, also of the pharmacies um, to stop selling them over the counter with any prescription. So then the next part of my talk uh, is a nutrition assessment of the elderly. So uh, here we have uh, Teresa. She did her MPhil project to present her data uh, on this. So 
to assess the nutritional status of the elderly, we use a minimal nutritional assessment, MNA. And this consists of several aspects, like the questions uh, on diet, mobility, health status, and eating habits, and also anthropomorphic measurements like body mass index, calf circumference, with arm circumference. And we take also 24 hour a week of the diet to look at um, what the, the average diet is, how much nutrients, how much vitamins, etc. Uh, they consume on a daily basis. And I will highlight her most important finding. So she looked um, at all 54 pneumonia patients that are included in the study. And so the, this MNA, sorry, MNA um, screening tool gives a score, and a score above 24 indicates normal nutritional status. That's only the case in 9% uh, of the pneumonia patients. 50%, so this gray part, have a nutritional MNA score uh, that indicates the risk of malnutrition, and like 40% has MNA score that indicates they are mal malnourished. Um, so in general, we see a very poor nutritional status in elderly of pneumonia uh, in the hospital in Ghana. And she then uh, further looked into uh, uh, variables that might explain this increased risk of malnutrition, so like marital status, age, uh, is the food that take is decreased, the mode of feeding, mobility, or psychological stress, uh, if they live independently, if they have multiple sub subscriptions. And what she basically found is that um, indeed there is a, a correlation between the food intakes, if there's a decrease in food intake, and uh, that's linked with the uh, risk of malnutrition, and also uh, the mode of feeding. So if the elderly um, difficulties feeding, so they cannot uh, cook for themselves, they cannot eat by themselves, they need to be fed by relatives, um, then it also has a negative impact uh, on the nutritional status. So we then next wondered, okay, so how does the nutritional status um, affect immune cells? So we still work on the analysis, but we started out with the, the healthy participants to just get the general idea of in the elderly. Um, when we compare people with a good versus a bad nutritional status, uh, how do the immune cells look like? So we took uh, five healthy elderly, a very low MNA score, and five very high MNA score, and we uh, looked at both immune cells through flow cytometry. This is a technique so that we can uh, look at different immune cell markers, for example, CD19 for B cells, CD3 for T cells. So there you can say this are my CD19 B cells. This is my T cell population. Um, and this is then what we see. So uh, there are more T cells than B cells, which you expect. Uh, we did not find any striking difference between the two uh, RNA scores. Uh, but also the data points, only five, so maybe adding more data points uh, might re reveal statistically significant difference. And then we zoom in a bit uh, on the T cells, so the different T cell subsets like CD4 T cells, uh, CD8 T cells, combined delta T cells. Um, and we see some trend that there's a bit lower CD4 T cells and high CD8 T cells in those with a low MNA score, but not statistically significant uh, at this moment. So we will look further into this. And at the B cells, we do not really look at the subsets, but we saw an interesting phenotype at the level of CD19, so the level of the B cell marker. Uh, and we see that um, to the left, it means it's a low level of the marker on the surface of the cell, and more to the right. Um, so there's more to the left, this more to the right, means there's a higher level of this marker on the cell surface. And uh, as you can see, the level of the marker does not correlate with nutritional status, so we have to investigate um, we're currently doing that to see what this then linked to. Um, but at least there's uh, interesting data to look at nutritional status uh, and immune cells, and also how this correlates with the uh, infection status. And then finally, uh, before we could start going to the field and sample, collect samples, um, we had some uh, to wait a little time, and we used that waiting time to do systematic literature research. So we looked for Stratocox pneumonia carriage 
uh, in Africa. So every study published in the past 20 years, the reports that Mona carries in Africa was included. So here we, oh, sorry, we show um, how many studies we could find per country and how many numbers, <coughs> sorry, of studies per country. So as you can see, like most of these are performed uh, in East Africa and in South Africa and a few in West Africa, but there are also many countries that have not any study published uh, at all. And this is very important uh, because if there is no knowledge about carriage of bacteria and antimicrobial resistant states of these bacteria, then we can also not adjust policy and adjust uh, treatment guidelines. So it's very important to gather all these data uh, and know what's going on in the continent. Uh, we then also um, want to see how carriage is affected by age. Uh, so that's the next graph and each circle represents one study. And you can immediately see that most studies were performed in children under the age of five. A few studies in adults around 30 years of age and very few studies uh, in the elderly. Uh, so there's also not so many data uh, on the elderly, which I think is, is lacking because we know that elderly has their own specific health issues. Then uh, within these papers reporting carriage, we also looked at microbial sensitivity. And here we reported uh, the non susceptibility uh, percentages for different uh, antibiotics in these papers. And we see high non susceptibility, especially for cotrimoxazole, tetracycline, and the penicillins. So that means that um, these antibiotics often won't work uh, in patients with pneumococcal uh, infections. So to conclude everything, uh, we see high antibiotic consumption on the guy and elderly. We see that they carry several different bacteria in them. And that overall, they have a poor nutritional status. So this is a picture of our nutrition students giving the elderly uh, a lecture on how they can improve their diet and eating habits. And in the future, we want to further look into microbial resistance of the different bacteria, identify the underlying resistant genes, and further examine the correlations to the immune system and infectious status, nutritional status. And I want to thank all the participants, their relatives, relatives, sorry, and of course collaborators at immunology, bacteriology, nutrition, and also at the hospitals, and of course Par Foundation for funding this project and Care for the Age and Art Lifestyle for helping us reach the elderly. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. I think um uh, no, uh, worth noting is, of course, that uh, the grant call that uh, you were part of, uh, the overall theme was to look into um, elderly care. Uh, and this year it's, like I said, finding new methods of um, spreading knowledge around um, antibiotic resistance. But thank you so much. Uh, I think I will carry on and please uh, ask questions to um, Elisa and um, Agustina in the chat if you want to. But let me just talk a bit about then um, uh, this year's call. I'm going to take over again uh, the screen and um, share with you uh, research uh, grant call criteria this year. So. Um, the, the grant call that one can apply for is up to 1 million Swedish crowns. That translates uh, as of today roughly to uh, 90,000 uh, euros. Uh, the project time that we see you using for that money is one to three years. Uh, and um, organizations that are eligible to apply is either research institutes, uh, nonprofits, uh, startups, but also individuals and um, uh, individual researchers uh, can apply. We don't have any uh, geographical boundaries, but we do evaluate uh, all potential candidates before granting uh, uh, the money, uh, just so you are aware of that, of course. Um, when it comes to then, um, the different type of uh, uh, projects that we look for. Well, 
We do encourage uh, bold and in, uh, innovative approaches, uh, we've said, and we, we want to really zoom in on new ways of uh, preventive actions this year. Uh, we look for projects that will advance insights on prevention. Um, and um, we do this because we need to, to protect uh, existing healthcare. Uh, there are many other companies who uh, spend money on developing new medicines. This grant is not for that. Uh, but we do encourage cross-disciplinary projects, looking at uh, uh, behavior science approaches that is uh, welcome. And um, we do welcome projects that uh, are of uh, high relevance for low and middle income countries. Uh, today, you know that uh, most of uh, the uh, casualties striving from Mayhem are, are happening in uh, low and middle income countries. Um, 35,000 approximately in Europe, but uh, over 2 million around the world. Um, we also do encourage multinational collaborations. So if you have partners in, uh, in a fellow uh, university across uh, the globe, then you're more than welcome to apply together. What do we not fund then? Like I said, we don't fund uh, development of new antibiotics. We don't uh, fund uh, medicine uh, development. Uh, we also do not encourage, um, uh, or, or rather we don't fund uh, participation in conferences and, and travels that are not directly uh, linked to the pro project that you're applying with. Uh, animal testing is something that we do not uh, want to encourage or promote, only where it's relevant and when you have a good rationale, it could be accepted, but uh, animal testing is not uh, a preference that we want to uh, encourage. And then also when it comes to educational programs or information campaigns, if they're not uh, lack, if they don't have a good uh, uh, likelihood to uh, uh, succeed and and talk about how to prevent infection and resistance. This is not part of the research grant that we fund. Um, what type of um, initiatives could, could it be then? And this is only examples. I just want to make that clear. This is not the only things that we look at, but it could be that you're exploring a way of uh, introducing better tools. Uh, for diagnosis to help identify infections more accurately and that can lead to a more targeted treatment, for example. Uh, or you're uh, looking at uh, ways of preventing the spread of bacterial infections like we talked about and, and doing so in uh, improving hygiene practice, uh, ways to keep uh, healthcare settings, hospitals, um in a better shape um it could also be that uh, you're looking at uh, the way uh, the actual bacteria is uh, developing resistance and and finding ways to uh, combat that uh, by doing research on their reaction to uh, the medicines that we have today could also be that you're exploring uh, microbiomes that uh, uh, affect the development of uh, bacterial infections and, and how the antibiotics become uh, less or more effective depending on uh, the therapies that you look at. And this could lead to new ways of uh, treating infections that are more targeted, more accurate, uh, that prevents the resistance to spread. These are just a few ideas. Um, 
we also have a few criteria that we believe in strongly. Um, of course, um, uh, the project should be of a certain importance. We believe that the projects that has a possibility to scale and to uh, uh, make an impact are more interesting to look at and to support than others. So we want to find projects that are not hobby projects, but has a potential to really change the way we um, treat patients and, and uh, understand uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, feasibility will uh, quite uh, obvious, but we look for projects that we believe could be successful. And when I say that, it means that we, we want to see the uh, team that you have around you, the way that the uh, project is um, designed based on the available budget that you ask for. And um, although we, we want bold and innovative approaches, but we really want to make sure that you can prove to us that you will use all the relevant information that is already out there. So the money and the product is used in the best possible way to become successful. Um, innovation, scalability, like I said, we believe that um, uh, if we are able to fund and find projects that will uh, scale to a, to more people, countries, uh, or areas, we tend to promote those projects. So um, that's what we look for in the applications. And then we also historically has been looking for projects in neglected areas. And this year, what we look for is then the new methods, especially uh, that we're zooming in on. So most probably it's areas where people have not uh, put money in yet. We're, we want to do that. Um, and again, zooming in on the uh, new methodologies around uh, preventing antibiotic resistance is what we're looking for in the research grant. Uh, I'll stop there. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, ask them in the chat or uh, feel free to... Uh, yes, Federico. Uh, Hi, Cecilia. Hey, how are you? Hi, how are you? Good. So I have two questions uh, quickly. Uh, one is regarding the the, the type of research so like um, um so is understood correctly so the the foundation is uh, is uh, trying to look for for new idea um so will this mean that also projects that are more on a let's say fundamental uh status and uh, early preclinical uh so still far to be you know to reach a a real concrete clinical application are also uh, are also encouraged. Absolutely. Uh, if I look at projects that we've uh, funded in earlier years, uh, we've seen that sometimes um, our uh, grants has helped to to overcome that first step in uh, in a project or being able to uh, support you in. Uh, making a bigger case or uh, reaching to a point where you can ask for funds elsewhere as well. So uh, when we talk about the overlooked areas or um, areas where other grant makers has maybe turned the project down, it's mm -hmm. because sometimes um, you you need to get started and you need the, uh, the project to be going before exactly. being able to uh, yeah, fine. great. And the, the second We've quick question was, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, regarding the animal testing. So, I mean, as, as you know, any type of uh, therapeutic approach uh, in order to go to, you know, a real clinical level needs mm -hmm. to go through animal testing. So the, the, the part in which you said the animal testing, so you mean that in general is uh, 
this encouraged or only the important animal testing necessary for the project is allowed? Correct. Uh, so when you have a rationale for when it's done and you describe it, then uh, that will, of course, be taken into consideration. But uh, we, we have said that where it's possible to avoid it, Mm -hmm. uh, we prefer that. So it's more being able to talk about it from a, a good rationale. Of course. Uh, that's what we're asking. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I see questions on um, the educational grant will be discussed uh, when we're closing this uh, session. Absolutely. Uh, so in, in a few minutes. Um, slides will be shared afterwards. Just ping me if I... I uh, haven't sent them to you, but uh, I will be able to share the slides with you. Um, fantastic. Any other questions on the research grant or uh, we continue? Three, two, one, sold. Okay, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll continue then. Um, let's look at the uh, educational grant instead. Uh, Eric, uh, will you give us a hint of uh, the project that you've been working on? Um, Eric has uh, started an organization in Rwanda called Oasis. And you will talk about a project where you've uh, uh, started an educational program for uh, health sciences, scientist students. I'll stop sharing and I'll give uh, over to you, Eric, and then I'll talk through the educational grant criteria when you're done. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Cecilia, uh, for giving me a platform to talk about uh, Oasis House project that we're learning in Rwanda, which is a part of this year educational grant. I hope you can hear me well. Absolutely. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and share my screen so that I can go through the presentation. Go ahead. And let me know if you can see the screen as well. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the project here is called Oasis Antibiotic Stewardship Program, and that is being learned by Oasis Health with the support from Par Foundation. And as I said, uh, it was a part of uh, educational uh, grants by Par Foundation this year, and is being implemented here in Rwanda. Uh, taking you through this project, um, I want to give you a brief introduction, a brief background of how Emara is in Rwanda, because Emara is an overtropic in Rwanda. We don't have a very big body of epidemiological data to quantify this problem but you have some studies that were carried in some teaching hospitals in Rwanda uh, that show that you have a potential resistant germs in Rwanda because that 1% and 58.7% of Essechiacuri and Eclipsella isolate were found to be resistant to the most commonly available antibiotics in Rwanda. The most commonly used antibiotics in Rwanda uh, the third generation uh, for sporins, uh, they are commonly available and they are affordable by most of the patients and are the most one commonly prescribed. But uh, as you can see, this level of resistance is a bit higher and you have to, to act responsibly. Uh, regarding to education of healthcare providers here in Rwanda, uh, up to the current knowledge, there is no specific module to MRA for doctors, pharmacists and nurses and other healthcare providers. And you can imagine how this can contribute to the split of MRI if people are not informed about how antibiotics, uh, how germs become resistant to antibiotics. Uh, also, Rwanda is among countries who are still developing with limited resources. So, so the resources include healthcare providers and scars and washing stations and other materials that can be used to contain third spread of MRA are in scars, and then this also contribute to the third development of antimicrobial resistance in our current settings. 
uh, after analyzing the background, so we came up with a, a solution. We came up with this program called the Antibiotic Strategy Program, so that we can mobilize policymakers and institutions in Rwanda to wake up and work on antimicrobial resistance. And we wanted this program to target frontliners. Frontliners are those healthcare providers who are working in hospitals, who are dealing with antimicrobials in their daily basis, who should be the one leading the fight against MRI in Rwanda. So we want to make them antibiotic stewards. We want to make them people who take it as a responsibility to preserve antimicrobial, antimicrobials. So we plan to have at least one person from each healthcare facility trained and empowered about containing MRI. Uh, this program will involve the development of a CPD certified course for healthcare providers. And we want to train them through an online course that can provide them CPD in several countries to make sure that the practice is standard. So people or healthcare providers have to update their knowledge and then they get some CPD credits per year. And this is the way the online course also will be delivered. And then the antibiotic stewards that train it uh, are encouraged to do peer-to-peer -peer teachings in their clinical settings. Uh, the methodology to do this, uh, first of all, we have in the brief four steps, the preparation, the cost development, cost promotion, and the long-term impact of the project. And then the preparation included endorsement of the program in several organizations, health governing institutions, and then the institutions that govern the practice and healthcare providers in Rwanda, including the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council, the Rwanda Nursing and the Middle of Union, even the Rwanda Allied Healthcare Providers Council, even other stakeholders, including district hospitals and health centers that will provide uh, the healthcare practitioners to be trained. The next step of the methodology is to develop the course. So we wanted to make a course which is multidisciplinary, which covers several aspects of the healthcare settings that can be adopted and that can be taken by anyone, including doctors, including pharmacists, including nurses, so that they can know their role in preserving antimicrobials. And this bring a teamwork purity in hospital settings. What should I do? If I'm a doctor, what should I do if I'm a nurse so that we work together uh, to preserve antimicrobials? Uh, after having this course fully developed, the next step is to promote it and then do the capacity breeding of healthcare providers. Um, we plan to treat 561 healthcare providers. Those are the people who represent each healthcare facility in Rwanda and um, these food hospitals and the lethal hospitals are represented by doctors, while health centers are represented by nurses because you don't have doctors there. And then the trained people do peer to peer education session in morning staffs at their hospitals. And uh, they also post restrictive charts in hospital settings, including uh, consultation room, including nursing station so that there are some do's and don'ts that you have to practice a daily in order to preserve our uh, antimicrobials. Uh, the long-term impact of this project is that this course is a long-term resource that can be used by several generations of healthcare providers and uh, the illustrating hospital charts also are posted there and are useful for everyone who pass by, can read the information and can get the message. Uh, as we do this project interdisciplinarily and uh, collaborating with several organizations. Also more organizations are expected to do some activities and to provide some impact in their daily activities that is related to containing our uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the objective of this program is to mobilize Rwandan healthcare leadership policymakers and other organizations to work on antimicrobial resistance. Yeah, because some governing organizations are working on TB, HIV, and other common drugs. But when you see the burden being brought by MRA, MRA should be it should come to the attention of the organization so that they can also work on them. And to have a mindset changing course for healthcare providers, yeah, because they are the front trainers, as I said before, they are the one who graduate how men and how much the antibiotics should be prescribed and how the patient should use them. 
So that's why I want to change their mind set through this course. And uh, we plan to mobilize at least more than 10,000 healthcare providers to have become the antibiotic steward to have taken the course by the 12 months of operation. Uh, each healthcare facility needs to have at least three charts describing the do's and don'ts in order to preserve um, antimicrobials. Uh, the partner organization, Scalantry, is the Rwanda Biomedical Center. The Rwanda Biomedical Center is the implementing entity of the Ministry of Health, and the University of Rwanda is the biggest hiring institution in the country. We also have other four organizations that legislate the practice. The first one is the Nursing and Midwife Council, the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council. The third council hosts allied healthcare professionals, including physiotherapists, and uh, medical imaging technicians, other people works at the hospital, but are not pharmacists, nurses, or doctors. And uh, the last patterning uh, institution is the National Pharmacy Council, which regulates the pharmacy practice in the country. Uh, we have a, a big team of professionals who are together to develop these courses, uh, who has developed this course. We have Dr. Roger Harrison, is a lecturer from the University of Manchester. We have a Dr. Noel Gahamani, is a lecturer from University of Rwanda and holds a PhD in microbiology. Uh, we have a Ms. Vanessa Crutcher, is a, a strong patient advocate on antimicrobial resistance and an advisor in the World Health Organization. We also bring to our team pharmacist Jack to Shimle as a part of the team to bring pharmaceutical insights so that the course will be multidisciplinary. We have also a nurse, is Oscar Mujisha is a one health nurse. So very committed in preserving antimicrobials and fighting MLA in one health perspective. And Dr. Jubilee Mbarashimana is the lab manager and um, specialist in pathogen laboratory sciences from the University Teaching Hospital of Butale. He also helped us to make sure that uh, the course is aligned and fits in the current healthcare system and the uh, hospitals uh, in Rwanda. Uh, so far, we have managed to build the course platform. Uh, it is available when you place that link, www.oasis.rw/rin. So you get to the home page of the course. And the course has a, this curriculum you can see. And uh, it provides people 10 CPD credits. Upon completing this course, uh, you get 10 CPD credits. Uh, it has several chapters, including the introduction to antimicrobial resistance. This chapter went further developed. Uh, it tells the people how MRI develops, what can be done, why do we have to act against MRI, and even the burden it will bring to healthcare. We have also another chapter that talk about MRI and One Health. Though this course is very specific to healthcare providers, this chapter is there to make sure that healthcare providers has this knowledge and they are empowered to educate their patients about uh, preserving antimicrobials in the One Health aspect. We also have an introduction to prescribing and dispensing stewardship. This commonly focuses on doctors and uh, pharmacists who prescribe and uh, who dispense. Now, the diagnostic stewardship also covers a lot of subjects, including sample collection, including requesting the light sample, including handling sample, including fighting sample contaminations and errors. Uh, the next chapter talks about the global effort to grab MRI, where it highlights how Several international organizations have settled several practices and measures to grab MRI. And this also included the development of a national antimicrobial resistance action plan to country levels. And the last chapter, and what I said that is very important one, is the communication and the behavior change training. This is where we try to change their mindset of healthcare providers so that they need to communicate and they need to educate their patients for the purpose of changing their behavior toward antimicrobial saving behavior. So this includes two parts, the changing of behavior from the healthcare provider's perspective, but also from the patient uh, perspective. Uh, inside the course platform, I try to have some screenshots. There is the objectives of the course and um, that is the curriculum. We try to make it as uh, easy as possible and easy to navigate. 
So if you want to learn more how like the platform is, you are welcome to go there and take the course. And the course was designed to meet low and income country settings because this is where you have a higher burden of antimicrobial resistance with very limited resources of containing uh, MRM. The course has approximately 10 hours to take 10 hours to complete and currently, though we have not promoted the course publicly, we have not launched it, we have already 40 students who are taking the course and their results are really uh, interesting. We have educational videos that count around roughly to three hours. Uh, you can wonder why this program uh, can help us to contain antimicrobial resistance very well. Yeah, because this is a multidisciplinary program and uh, it is focused in one context and other low income countries. It is also education based and uh, it is targeting those people who are educated, who know, who can understand the impact of antimicrobial resistance and their law in containing it. I provide CPD credits, which act as a motivation to healthcare providers to, to take the course. It also targeted those in practice, I mean those healthcare providers, if they're not informed about the effect and how to prevent antimicrobial resistance, it will be a challenge for someone from the village not educated to take antimicrobial resistance uh, as a concern. Uh, this, these are our contacts, our website and emails for further communication. And I can thank you so much for being with me in this presentation, welcoming questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Um, this is a great example of a project that um, is uh, putting together a educational program for more individuals to, to learn and uh, spread information about preventive active. I'm gonna put these on. <laughs> I am also going to take over the screen again from you, Eric. Um, and um, I'm gonna share my screen so we can talk a bit about the educational uh, grant then. And again, feel free to um, write questions in the chat if you want to. But the educational grant then, uh, we see these as uh, shorter terms. So from one month up to a year, 12 months, um, they could be uh, 300,000 Swedish crowns. Uh, that translates to roughly 27,000 euros. Uh, same deadline, uh, April 12. And um, the people we believe uh, apply for these grants are either students with uh, bachelor and master levels, it's PhD students. It is individuals who have graduated already or will graduate but also organizations who offers internships and or educational programs uh, to the next generation of researchers. Same thing goes here. We, uh, it's open for um, uh, all geographies, but we do uh, screen all uh, grant recipients before they uh, are accepted as uh, a grantee. Um, what do we fund them? Well, uh, like I've said now, training programs similar to what uh, Eric talked about or ambassador programs where you educate more individuals to go out and do training on their own in their local context. Uh, it could be awareness campaigns, awareness uh, uh, competitions. It could be documentaries or other type of communication materials that reaches uh, an interesting target audience. It could be internships, uh, like I said. Uh, it could be uh, someone working for an organization with uh, the aim to uh, uh, spread knowledge around antibiotic resistance, but uh, being uh, needing more funding for the living cost. Um, it could also be supporting uni researchers from a non-STEM field who wants to go into 
uh, research uh, around healthcare. Um, we also look at uh, pilot studies uh, done by uni researchers. Again, uh, people who want to get into the field and uh, who want to advance their career um, could be eligible. Uh, we don't fund uh, hobby projects. They need to have that certain uh, reach, that certain um, uh, impact that I talked about earlier. Um, again, uh, treatment is not an option here. Either we don't look for new medicine, we look for uh, preventive actions. Uh, here it's even more important to to secure if you're still studying or if you're still uh, doing your uh, PhD, we need to know that you have the good support around you to be able to to conduct the study. So um, uh, we will make sure that the grantees for this uh, grant is having the necessary support around them to be able to to draw the right conclusions and make the right uh, educational material. Uh, yeah, and if we don't see that uh, the internship that you're applying will will make you a stronger healthcare professional, then it's not likely that we fund that either. Uh, I will be able to share these slides for you as well afterwards if you want to. Uh, but I went over this. Uh, you heard this. What I'm zooming in on here in the overlooked areas is really the next generation of researchers spreading knowledge to a broader group of individuals. So we combat uh, uh, preventive or resistance together. Um, I won't go over these again. It is the same uh, uh, timeline for this grant as for is a educational grant. So just to sum things up here, um, the grant call, whether it's the research grant call you apply for or the educational grant call, deadline is April 12. Uh, we will make sure to uh, uh, take the decisions end of May and we'll contact uh, selected candidates, grantees, first week of June. The external communication will happen mid-June. Uh, go to parfoundation.org uh, if you want to read more. You will find the forms, which gives you an indication of the questions that we ask for as well. And it's pretty straightforward. It's quite uh, easy to follow. So. It should be self-explanatory. Um, otherwise, you reach out to me. I'm available all the time. Uh, Cecilia.dalstrom at parorganization.org. Uh, let's see. I see a few questions here. Uh, and let me see if I can see the chat as well. And um, let's see, where were I? Scope of education programs and employee professional prescribers like doctor, pharmacists. Um, so Gerald, and um, I'm assuming now that you talk about the educational program, uh, to whom is it directed? Well, uh, we aim for passionate ambassadors to uh, fight anti uh, antibiotic resistance. So it doesn't necessarily have to be doctors or nurses, but people with a passion to fight uh, antibiotic resistance. Most of the time we find them in uh, among doctors and pharmacists and nurses, medicine students. Um, uh, what about research grant? We would not found section. Uh, Maybe Bharat, you text me afterwards. We went through that. Um, so ping me, I'll also send you the slides so you can take a look at them there. Um, academians, uh, mid-careers eligible to apply for the grant. Yes, uh, the educational grant could be uh, applied for mid-careers, absolutely. Uh, 
what we we'll look for is uh, educational programs to spread knowledge and increase insights uh, to the next generation of uh, researchers. But uh, yes, you are very uh, four institutions applying for the main grant you mentioned an allowable indirect up to 30 uh, percent that is correct the uh, the one million uh, is the full grant and um, sometimes institutions uh, have indirect costs and we uh, we allow uh, this up to 30 percent of the grant. We obviously want as much as possible of the money to go directly to the program and the project that you're running. Um, good. Uh, Martin, yes, I will send you the slides afterwards. Um, okay. Maybe um, we have reached three o'clock, so I will stop here. Uh, thanks for joining. And um, feel free to reach out to me separately. Uh, a big thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Take care too. Take care.